Okay, so my name's David Veal. I am a consultant psychiatrist at uh, the South London Morsey NHS Trust and at the Priory Hospital North London and a professor at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London. And we're going to be talking today about your relationship with your thoughts and seeing how you can change your relationship with your thoughts. Oops. So, we all know, you all know, what OCD is, and I'm not going to focus today on the content of these OCD symptoms. I'm going to be talking more about the process. And so, of course, uh, the most common ones are around contamination, um, harm about uh, the safety of objects and loved ones, having things in order, symmetry, um, unacceptable thoughts, as you heard from Rose just now, and images and sensations, commonly about sex or relationships, uh, violence, aggression, religious, blasphemy, the devil. Sometimes you can be very creative and combine all three in one single image. Uh, and then there are some less common ones, of course, like sensory motor ones, somatic ones, existential thoughts, embarrassing, shameful acts, and meaningless sounds and words and music. And by definition, of course, all these are distressing, they're interfering in life, and they prevent you from acting on your values. But as I said, we're not going to discuss the content of any of that stuff, because they're all a load of bollocks. <laughs> and it's just not worth discussing. Yes? So let's just drill down a little bit deeper in terms of what is an obsession, the form it takes. And so by definition in OCD, in those contents, they are repetitive, unwanted, intrusive thoughts, images, doubts, sensations. And they're not simply excessive worries or about real life problems. <coughs> they're usually inconsistent with your values and what's important in your life. And of course, you may respond by trying to ignore them, suppress them, neutralize them, or do a compulsion. them. But the question is, which I trace today, is what makes an obsession? How do you transform uh, a thought, an image, into an obsession? That's what I'm going to try and focus on. So what we're looking at is how do thoughts work? And I'm using the term thoughts here. It's just a shorthand for uh, intrusive thoughts, doubts, images, urges, sensations, sometimes even a flash. Yeah? So um, that... As I emphasize this now, the thoughts themselves are not the problem. It's the, what we'll be arguing is the catastrophic meaning and the importance of thoughts that makes the obsession and the various ways you may respond to it in terms that includes avoiding them or trying to do various compulsions around them. And what I want to try and do first of all is try and think a little bit more about trying to unpack the meaning and the importance that you might attach to these thoughts. And as I said, we're not going to be focusing on the content because, as I'm sure you've been told many times, the thoughts by themselves are normal. If you do surveys of the public uh, about such thoughts, they all have exactly identical thoughts. We're going to focus more on the process. How do these thoughts become a, a, an obsession? Um, I have, with my colleague Mark Freeston, identified at least 10 different processes that we're going to describe. But please let us know if, you can have a, if you've got another process, you think, which might account for things. Um, and it may well be that your own intrusive thoughts have got one or more of these processes as well. So um, the first thing to say is that our minds are very good at keeping us safe. Yes? And we're constantly vigilant and it's hard to turn down when there is a threat. Um, it's sensitive, it's designed to overact because that's the best way of keeping us safe. And it focuses our mind on danger and the worst case scenarios. That's, that's the way it's built. Um, and it works very well, of course, when we've got external threats like lions and muggers and things like that. And in these situations, it shouts very loudly and drowns out other parts of our mind. So that's the way it's designed. Now the problem is, of course, with our thoughts now become a threat, we become very self-focused. Yeah? And uh, I sometimes like going to Chelsea Flower Show 
yes? And one year I saw this piece of sculpture there. Uh, not that I want it in my own garden, but uh, this is absolutely brilliant description for me of self-focused attention, yes? You've got all your information in your head from all the shit in your head, as it were. And so what you're getting is this extreme self-focused attention, yes? In other words, you, get, you don't get information from the world around you, you're getting it from what your mind is telling you. And that is because of this difficulty with our attention, that it's focused on, our, uh, on the threat. Uh, so if your thoughts become a threat, your attention is going to go in that way. And one of the problems often is, is that these thoughts and imagery become fused with past negative experiences. So if you've been unfortunate to be bullied or uh, to have had difficult childhood experiences and so on, then some of these few thoughts and images have become fused with some of these early experiences and they get very mixed up. And that's why there's, been, you know, there's a little bit of interest in trying to uh, update some of these early experiences. If you've got some ability to switch attention between being very self-focused and externally focused, then there's probably more doubts that you might have. You can't quite work out what's going on. If you're more living in your head all the time, then actually um, you're going to become more convinced about how true these things are. So that's why in therapy, the, one of the emphases is all about trying to get you to become externally focused, yes? To focus your attention externally on the world around you as it is and not on what your thoughts and, and mind are telling you. <coughs> and that's very tricky because I'm saying by definition your mind is designed to keep you safe and it wants to keep you focused on the threat and trying to act against that and switch your attention so that it becomes more focused externally is difficult. But I'm just saying it's, that it's a good general principle to get out of your head. It is dangerous to live in your head. Yes, one of these days we're going to have sort of uh, things like cigarette advertising. You know where there's all the things about cig bad things of cigarettes and so on. We're going to have to be talking about being self-focused and ruminating is dangerous for your health. It's it's a big, big, big public health problem. <laughs> right. So what about these other processes that turn thoughts into obsessions? So one of them is uh, the first one we're going to talk about, is the fear of belief that having a thought about losing control can lead to yourself losing control and acting upon it, yes? So if I have, um, as I did this morning, as I came in on the tube, if I have a thought about pushing someone in front of a train, I'm afraid I might lose control and act upon it, yes? The idea that just thinking about it means I'm going to act upon it. And, of course, this is, again, part of the tricky brain, that... Uh, we, we uh, are designed to keep ourselves safe. And, of course, in therapy, therefore, it's very important to test out those predictions and be able to do the very things that you fear and believe that, that, that you, you're capable of doing. And that's why it's important to have yourself, you know, if you're thinking you're going to murder someone, to have uh, knives up against your therapist's throat and this, that, and the other. So these are all standard therapy processes. The second thing... Um, the process we want to define is thoughts cause harm, okay? So this is where you have a fear or belief that having a thought about harm means that you have the power to cause it just by having the thought. So uh, if you have a thought about a loved one dying in a road traffic accident, I believe my thoughts could make it happen. So this is what we usually associate with sort of superstitious behaviours. And what's very interesting is that actually these are normal child thinking processes. If you go uh, and, and talk to children age four or five or something, then when we, uh, so we say, uh, encourage them to blow out all the candles on the birthday cake or something, uh, make a wish, we say, don't we? Make a wish. And at that age, you believe that you can uh, make things happen by making a wish. And this is probably quite helpful for you at this age because the world is quite confusing and you're trying to control things around you more and try and problem solve in that way. Yeah? So it's a normal developmental phase that we go through but sort of got stuck in, in OCD where you've gone back to this sort of wishful, magical thinking, superstitious thinking. And therefore, of course, in therapy, it's important to try to make bad wishes and try to make bad things happen to your, your loved ones. 
Next one is, is defined as moral equivalence, yeah? So a fear of belief that having a thought about a bad event is morally the same as making it happen. So thinking about raping a woman or swearing to God is morally the same as actually doing it. And this is a little tricky, particularly some of the more religious ones, because of course this may well be taught in certain more orthodox religions. Um, and the key thing here, of course, in therapy is learning that you have no control over your thoughts, uh, the intrusive thoughts. You, you, you know, usually the person who has this type of problem has very strong morals, um, and this is now interfering in their ability to function. And they're probably not applying the same rules to other people. Uh, it's just something that's very much, they, they believe that they have to stick to. Um, sometimes they may uh, be consistent and apply it to others as well, but um, usually it's, it's the other way around. Next process we got is intentionality. Yeah? And this is a fear or a belief that having a thought about it means that the person must secretly want it or must wanted it to occur. So if I have thoughts about hurting someone, it means deep inside I want to hurt that person. Yes. This is a sort of Freudian idea that somehow in the unconscious seeping through that really this is what you really want. Um, but, you know, the, the issue here again is that the person who's having this particular uh, process is very worried about hurting others and they're deeply concerned about it. What about agency? This is where you have a thought about a bad event and it then makes you responsible by just having the thought. So by having a thought about an accident happen, it makes me responsible for preventing it from happening. Um, and this is where, of course, in, in OCD, you have these godlike powers to prevent bad events from happening. And what we need to look at more is the, the alternative theory that, again, that you're very worried about bad things happening and then feel this that you have to have uh, the ability to prevent it from happening. And that's why we have, again, all these anti-OCD type tasks. What about six, foretelling? Here is a fear of belief that having a thought about an event means it will happen in the future, or that somehow it's an omen, yes? So if I have a thought about something bad happening to my family, it will then happen in the future. It, it's the idea that you can foretell the future just by thinking about it. Again, it's these godlike powers that you can look into the future with foresight. Again, the alternative theory is that, again, you're very worried and fearful about bad things happening. Ex-consequential reasoning. Well, this is where you have a fear that having a thought about an event means it must have happened in the past. Yeah? So if I have a thought about being a paedophile in the past, it means I probably was. And it leads to all sorts of problems, doesn't it, in terms of confessions, uh, going to the police because you think you've run someone over, and all sorts of things like this. So this is where we're having problems about, you know, you have, you have the thought, therefore you've got to mentally review and check to see whether you've done it in the past. Transfer, right. Um, a fear or belief that having a thought can transfer properties onto another object or person just by having the thought. So if I think my hands are contaminated, then I can transfer the contamination onto objects through my thoughts. And um, this is why uh, when I perhaps visit a home, do a home visit on someone with contamination OCD, we have all these clean zones and unclean zones. All this notion of things being transferred from one thing, clean object, to, a, to an unclean object, and so on. Um, associations. Um, so the, well, I want, just want to demonstrate this very briefly. Here we have a person who's been described as Britain's worst paedophile. Yes? He's up in Broadmoor or somewhere at the moment. And he has raped, murdered, you know, hundreds of children in Thailand. And um, by luck, or whatever, I managed to get him to um, donate uh, via another psychiatrist his, um, one of his old pullovers. <laughs> yeah? Now, I've just realized I've left it over there in my bag over there, so I'm just going to go and get it. And I've just wanted to perhaps a volunteer, just have a think of the moment, who would like to wear his pullover and demonstrate the, the process of transfer. Dry clean. 
I'm not even going to touch it. <laughs> so this is, this is the principle of um, transfer, isn't it? All the badness of this paedophile is going on to this kind gentleman. <laughs> we take a picture of it. So, uh, it'll be on the video, won't it? Will it? No. Will someone take, take a picture? <laughs> So I'm doing the, this in a picture. No. <laughs> so the idea here is that these, the badness, the transfer, is being passed on to this gentleman. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> That's all. Excellent. I don't know how many other people here are going to do that. <laughs> it probably depends upon how much you know you have these, uh, this particular process, you know, transfer. Actually, this was a big deal for me. Well done. In a way, because yes. I do have fears about that issue. Excellent. Well done, thank you so much. You're very welcome. For next time. Um, now, it's really interesting, I think, that when you transfer negative things, that healthy people often feel that they can transfer positive things as well. Yeah? And uh, I did some teaching in Israel uh, recently. And one of the places I went to in Jerusalem was a place called the... Um, Church of the Holy Spukot in Jerusalem. Anyone else been there? Yeah, well, a few people, yeah. So this is a course where uh, Jesus is uh, buried and so on. And um, there's a place where he's meant to be anointed. Yeah. And just have a look at these pilgrims. When we get a chance. <laughs> Point being is they're trying, these are, you know, they don't have OCD or anything, but they're trying to transfer, aren't they, the positive things of Jesus into themselves, yes, by transferring it onto their um, clothes and, and other cloths so they can take home this bit of Jesus. So the idea is that you can transfer goodness and badness, of course, from one object to another, and then it can get transferred from one thing to another ad infinitum, isn't it? Yeah, and you can even do it just in your head. You can imagine transferring things from one thing to another. The human mind is incredible in terms of the way that we can make associations from one thing to another. But I'm just saying that this process is, of course, uh, quite dangerous then in OCD because it really does keep your distress going. Yeah? All right. Um, this one's a little bit tricky to describe, this next process. The fear of belief that you have a thought about an event, it means that one had, then has the power to undo it just by un, un, having the thought. So let's say uh, you've got a thought about your clean hands being contaminated, it then makes them contaminated just by having that intrusive thought popping into your head. And this is often what we see in, in what we call more mental contamination. So the last one we've got is the notion of equivalence. The fear of belief that having a thought means that an object possessing possesses or shares the quality of the content of the thought.
just by having it, yes? So if I have a disgusting thought and see a person, then the person becomes as disgusting as the thought, yeah? This is the power of the human mind. And, of course, in, in OCD, it's become taken to extreme versions. So what we're discussing in all these different processes is the idea about the importance of thoughts, yes? And that, um, as you can see, that some thoughts are perhaps more important than, than others because they're incompatible with your sense of self and your values. It's what uh, therapists call these thoughts are ego dysonic. They don't fit with your values or your sense of self. So, for example, um, Back to this thing, you know, I have a thought about a loved one dying in a road traffic accident. I believe my thoughts could actually make it happen. It doesn't seem to work the other way, doesn't it? You know, in terms of <laughs> having thoughts about winning the lottery. <laughs> it only works always in OCD in the negative way. Yeah. So it's, it's all about things which are important to you, and that's why they seem to take such a um, sense of responsibility around them. So the other thing that we can think about. So that's how thoughts work at one level in terms of the way we interpret them and these processes that, that make them tricky. But we can also think about these processes at a higher level. And we, we uh, can think of uh, the six C's, yes? Need for comfort, need for control, certainty, being correct, co uh, not fo focusing on the content and doing a compulsion. Um, I'm trying, if someone can come up with a C for me to describe avoidance, I'd be very grateful, because I couldn't this morning. <laughs> um, all these different game processes keep the distress and, and the interference in life. So let's just go through each of them. The thing around comfort for uh, thoughts is that what we process of emotional reasoning. So this is a general process. It's not specific to OCD. Um, and here, your reasoning is based upon the presence of the emotion. And, and you're really saying, I have to feel comfortable with my thoughts. And the, the notion is that if I feel anxious or revulsion when I have a thought about contamination, say, then it must be a threat because of the presence of that particular emotion. Yes? And I've got to feel comfortable with my thoughts before they're no longer a threat. So this is a, a major process that cuts across, of course, all sorts of different types of disorders. When you're more depressed, you know, because you don't feel like it doing something, then you can't do it, and so on. If I uh, feel down, then I must be a failure, and so on. So the next process is around control, and this is a big issue in uh, intrusive thoughts, and so on. And control is also synonymous with influence. Um, and, and the notion here is the attitude that we can and should have control over intrusive thoughts. But you know, the reality, of course, is, is that you have absolutely no control. Um, and the thoughts that pop into your head reflect your own fears and, the, and your creativity. You know, uh, people with OCD are extremely creative in terms of some of their ideas that they have. And... Um, this is part of the human mind, to be able to problem solve, to be creative, to come up with ridiculous, absurd things. And of course, in therapy, it's all about giving up control over your intrusive thoughts. And uh, another common one, of course, is the need for certainty. Um, and this is where, of course, not knowing something is worse than actually knowing a bad outcome. Um, and the notion is, that I have to know for certain whether my intrusive thought is true or not, yes? Um, and of course, the only guarantee in life is what is death and taxes, and there is a third guarantee in OCD that says, you know, that whilst you continue to demand a guarantee that uh, this thought is true or not, then you will disturb yourself for the rest of your life, yes? And one of the things in therapy is about learning to tolerate not knowing things, to tolerate doubts, because the more you try to find an answer and get a guarantee about something, you will disturb yourself and be interfering in your life for the rest of your life. That is the absolute guarantee, yeah? Absolute guarantee. Um, content, so this is, uh, again, a big problem, of course, in intrusive thoughts, is where people focus 
on the content of the obsession. You know, am I a paedophile? Am I gay? Is this contaminated? Is that blood? Was the door unlocked? And so on. And the problem here is you're not focusing on the process, yes, in terms of some of the things I've just described. And you're really wanting answers to whether something is harmful. Um, and one of the things, of course, hopefully you will learn is that trying to get answers, that process creates more doubts um, and more questions. But what if? But what if such and such? And so on. And it feeds this constant rumination and self-reassurance and so on. So it's about not focusing on the content. Um, another thing is having things correct, isn't it? The idea is, is that with your intrusive thoughts, you have to have them feeling correct, complete, or perfect, or feeling just right with your thoughts, just so. Um, and this is often associated with the need for order, for uh, having to do things, repeating actions, until it feels just so, just right. Um, it's interesting. This is, it's not a sense of panic. There's often more of a, a lower level of general anxiety and tension with this particular demand. And like many of the other C's, you're putting the cart before the horse, because in order to uh, feel correct and so on, you have to do things in an incorrect way. You have to do things feeling wrong and so on in order to feel right. Avoidance, and remember, someone's going to come up for me and give me a C, which will uh, <laughs> make it all correct. Cost. Can't. Can't. Excellent. <laughs> Countering. Maybe. Countering. Countering. Circumvent. That would be a more of a safety behaviour, wouldn't it? But <laughs> yeah, I think we're, we're getting there. We're getting there, so I can't do it. So, when we apply these to thoughts, um, you might particularly avoid triggers and cues for the thoughts. Um, you might uh, avoid the thoughts altogether by trying to suppress them, not have them. Um, there might be more emotional avoidance, isn't it? This is where you go down the path of binge drinking or using drugs or eating or sleeping all the time to try and not experience things. Um, and of course, the therapy you know, is to test out those particular fears and, and to approach difficult things rather than to avoid. Okay, um, and the big one, of course, is the compulsions. And we know that there are lots of uh, physical compulsions, and we're going to try and focus a bit more on, on the mental compulsions. So, by definition, uh, compulsions are normally repetitive behaviours or mental acts in response to obsessions, although there is some movement at the moment that says it's the compulsions that drive the obsessions. Uh, but I'm not going along with that one. Um, it's, the, it's very much motivated, these compulsions, by reducing emotion and anxiety and disgust and feeling not right, um, or preventing harm by checking, verifying whether something's true or whether a threat exists, or what we call reparation, trying to undo something like uh, washing and cleaning. And, of course, you're more likely to escape and avoid a situation when there's an immediate threat, and very often there's that seesaw between compulsions and avoidance, depending upon whether it's an immediate threat or not. And what we're trying to try and focus on today is a little bit more on the mental compulsions. Uh, so examples might be special words, images, numbers recreated mentally to, to control or neutralize thoughts, special prayers repeated in a set manner, mental counting, mental list making, mental washing. That's tricky. Uh, and I still never quite fully understand this when someone describes me how they mentally wash their thoughts. But anyway, that's what they said they did. <laughs> uh, mentally reviewing their actions, uh, self-reassurance, oh, it's just my OCD. Rational responses, oh, well, I was 300 mil miles away from the murderer, so I couldn't possibly have committed it. And when we think about obsessions with mental compulsions, that's when we use the term uh, ruminating. Um, and, of course, always think about the function. The aim is to prevent harm from occurring, check whether harm has happened, or to reduce your distress. But, of course, the solution has then become your problem, and it keeps them, uh, the obsessions going. 
And the whole thing about exposure and response prevention, behavioral experiments, is their deliberate and planned activities that involve facing your fears and <coughs> testing out your predictions or expectations. And that, therefore, means deliberately approaching feared situations, your feared thoughts, images, doubts, and urges to test out whether your experience best fits with a worry problem and just tolerating that anxiety. Can we, can we talk about it? questions at the end? Yes. Can, can we just do the questions at the end? Um, and whether it just, you know, best fits with a worry problem, learning to tolerate the anxiety without any compulsions or safety-seeking behaviours. But one of the things that is always difficult is how, thinking about how you apply those principles to the thoughts and, and mental compulsions. So one of the things that um, uh, in therapy, it, well, we can have the obsessional choice, the OCD way, of course. Um, we can do things in the non-OCD way, which just means not doing the things you're doing. And one of the things that would be more helpful to actually overcome the OCD is doing things in the anti-OCD way, which is going over the top, overlearning, hunting tigers, trying to seek out those unwanted thoughts and cues rather than just passively wait for them to occur. So, and this is something, you know, something you might talk about in the discussion afterwards, and I'm still not sure about because we don't really have a good evidence base for this. How do you do exposure and experiments sometimes with thoughts? It's often easy to develop exposure tasks to situational activities that you avoid, you know. Um, in, so even if you've got intrusive thoughts about being uh, um, a paedophile or something uh, you, and you're avoiding school, places like schools, um, then it's obvious you need to be able to go past children and be able to babysit for them and everything else. But how do you do exposure to those thoughts and images and sensations? Uh, there are two main schools, shall we say. One is just to tolerate the doubt and uncertainty. Uh, it may be true, maybe not. Um, but the key thing is obviously not responding to those intrusions. Um, you're doing things in life despite them. And we often have the idea of a metaphor of passing cars in the traffic. So in other words, let's imagine you know, there is always traffic in the street and the red cars represent the thoughts that you don't want. You know, you can either spend your life going into the traffic and trying to stop the car and divert it down one way or get into the car and park it and sort it out, but then another one comes along. So you can either spend your life in the traffic or hopefully what you want to be able to do is to uh, be able to walk down the path and be able to play in the park and do the things in life which are important to you despite the traffic, yes? In other words, you're not trying to control the traffic, it's just there and it passes all the time. Now, there's another school which says that to do true exposure, you need to be able to exaggerate your fears. <coughs> and sometimes people do this with sarcasm and humor. I think it's very tough to ask people to do with vivid images, say, of abusing a child and loop tapes and things like that. And so I think this is something that's, well, something for discussion. It's tricky, and I don't usually wouldn't normally recommend that so much. It's, it's quite often easy when you're using sarcasm, let's say, about uh, contamination. And yes, everyone in London is now being contaminated because you've touched such and such and, and so on. Uh, it's everything spreading everywhere. The whole of England's closed down and, and so on. That's, that's okay, but I just think it's a little tricky with doing those sorts of things with sort of very vivid images and so on, trying to deliberately imagine yourself doing more of those things that you are uh, most afraid of. And I would probably focus more on, on the first thing, just trying to tolerate the doubts. But some people do swear blind by this uh, and making it worse and so on. So I'm, I'm just saying it's very difficult to do research in this area. So what do we mean by response prevention? And uh, many people with OCD will, you mean, what's all I have to do is just stop it? Is that it? <laughs> um, and that would be the definition, wouldn't it? A person with OCD is encouraged to stop doing the rituals and eventually learn that they can tolerate the stress and there are no harmful consequences. Um, so 
what, how are you going to stop doing compulsions, both physically and, of course, mentally, which we're trying to focus on today? I mean, there are some general guidelines. Make sure you don't compensate by, you know, if supposing you uh, then start avoiding touching things more because you're washing your hands less and avoiding your thoughts more because you're doing more compulsions. So it's just, you know, moving the seesaw from one side to another. And for treatment to be effective, you, you always need to combine the exposure and ritual prevention together. And often what I hear from when people come see me about their past experiences of therapy, and I really don't understand this, is often response prevention only, that the therapist has said, oh, maybe you can reduce your rituals from 500 a day to 490 a day or something. You know, it's just complete rubbish. Um, always try to, when you can, combine it with testing out your expectations and, and predictions. Um, and always try to understand your motivations or your beliefs about the compulsions. In general, there are three main motivations. One is around avoiding harm and uh, trying to... Um, the key thing in therapy is trying to violate your expectations. You know, if this is what you're predicting, is this true? And therefore, you're trying to follow the alternative theory that this is a problem to do with worrying about uh, something happening. The other big one, mainly around uh, contamination and certain types of intrusive thoughts, is the avoidance of the emotion of disgust. And so therefore, you're learning in therapy to tolerate that distress and the feeling of revulsion. And lastly, uh, again, not talked about so much, is the motivation to avoid feeling not just right. Um, and again, this is often associated more with order, symmetry, repeating actions. And again, it's about learning to tolerate the distress, feeling wrong, and particularly trying to activity schedule, because very often people are doing very little. They're constantly feeling in their life trying to feel just right. And it's important to structure your day and do things in life despite it. And it can also be helpful to identify the criteria you use for finishing the compulsion. So often uh, in OCD, it's, it's about feeling when I feel comfortable, uh, when I feel just right. And these, of course, are very problematic because it's normal when it's very high importance. You know, when someone decides who they're going to get married to or if they can buy a house somewhere, they usually do it because um, they feel comfortable with them. They feel just right or something like that. So these are decisions of very high importance, so it's normal. Um, and the key thing in, in OCD is, of course, is to finish when you're uncomfortable or it feels not right in various ways. And all these things are just as relevant for mental compulsions. And one of the tricky compulsions, of course, is reassurance-seeking and self-reassurance. And traditionally, uh, of course, everyone knows that you should have no reassurance. But, you know, blocking from the outside is often by itself unsuccessful. In other words, teaching people just to give no reassurance. Because often they then become self-reassurance. You reassure yourself all the time, or it just causes lots of problems with your relative. The alternative is to make sure that you are teaching your relatives and friends to try and provide compassion and emotional support, but not discuss the content of the particular obsession. So in other words, you may say to your relative, uh, I'm feeling anxious, um, and ask them for what it is that you need. You know, can I have a hug? Can I have a cup, a cup of tea? Can we go for a walk? And so on. But you're not, in other words, you're seeking emotional support, but you're not discussing the content of your particular obsession. And then equally, you can then apply that in self-compassion, can't you? Because absolutely crucial is your relationship with yourself and how you talk to yourself. And many people with OCD, of course, have got enormous amounts of shame and are very self-critical about their intrusive thoughts and difficulties. And so it's absolutely crucial, I think, in the future to be able to learn how to talk to yourself uh, in terms of, of a compassionate uh, manner being non-judgmental, and even right down to the tone of your voice in terms of being caring and supportive rather than having a sort of critical edge to it. And one of the tricky things, of course, are all these covert uh, compulsions. The overt compulsions and safety behaviours are more obvious and everyone can see them, but covert ones are more sneaky. 
particularly where you're having to uh, analyze the task or repeatedly review the evidence very carefully to make sure something's safe or trying to force yourself to relax and be calm. Yes, keep telling yourself it's safe or some sort of phrase you've learnt. Try to control, switch off, distract yourself, transform the, new, uh, the obsession, neutralise them, all try to undo the, the particular thought. And this very critical, harsh tone of your inner voice will try to shame yourself for having that. So what I'm saying here is it's very important to be aware of your inner world, what it is that you're doing and how it functions, what's the motivation, you know, doing what we call make a chain analysis. Okay, here's the intrusive thoughts, this is the process that I do with it, and this is how I respond to it in various ways. And these are the things, of course, that keep the problem going and are uh, unhelpful. Um, and one of the things we like to think about uh, the OCD is often it's like it's a bully. Um, in our anxiety disorders residential units at the Bethlehem Royal, we have um, the OCD bully, which is a piece of artwork, um, and you can see there it's a very tall figure which uh, has got lots of manifestations of OCD on the outside, things like uh, you can see knives there being used to stab, it's got the horns of the devil, it's got a toilet seat around it, it's got 666, it's got uh, a, waste, a, a clock for all the wasted time of compulsions and the, and the chains of compulsions and so on. And it's got this big cylinder in front of it which actually collects our safety-seeking objects and safety objects. Uh, in other words, we uh, encourage our residents to dump in there the things that they've been using to, to keep them safe from their obtrusive thoughts and so on. So there might be in there a bottle of Domestos, someone else has put a pair of handcuffs in there for someone who believes that they might hit out and hurt someone, and so on. So these are the safety objects which we need to dump as well. I mentioned briefly compassion, and um, I, again, I think this is a very important development which uh, I think we'll see a lot more research in, particularly the nature of self-compassion. And we can define compassion as being sensitive to the suffering of yourself and others with a deep commitment to try and relieve it. And we can think of this as um, having empathy, understanding, sympathy, care, as well as tolerating distress and courage and the wisdom to try and approach difficult things. And the key thing there, again, is being about non-judgmental. So it's two sides of a coin. One is the sensitivity to your suffering. Um, and the key thing here in compassion, rather than avoiding, it's about turning towards, connecting with ourselves and our difficult experiences, engaging with our distress and needs, and showing an understanding in a non-judgmental manner. The issue, of course, here, it's not your fault that you've got OCD. It's bad luck when you're born with OCD in terms of certain genes and where you've been brought up and this, that and the other. It's not your fault. And then, of course, there's the other side of the coin is about having a commitment to try and relieve it and uh, using your strength, courage and wisdom. So it requires a lot of courage to overcome OCD. Um, and the key thing here is approaching distressing thoughts motivated by your values, the things which are important in your life and your own well-being. Uh, you can read about it more in our Overcoming OCD book. And uh, I think we've probably got some time for a few questions. Um, just to say, uh, if you're ever out, I strongly recommend going down to the Bethlehem where we have the Museum of the Mind, which is a fantastic little museum open, I think, on Thursdays and fr Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, some Saturdays. Um, and the, as you can see in the entrance there, the two big statues which were in the entrance to the very first Bethlehem uh, hospital. Uh, one was, uh, this, these are the statues that confronted view in the 12th, 13th century or something. One I think is of raving uh, melancholia and, and no, raving madness and melancholia, one on, on each side of the gates. And that's now in the museum, the first thing that you see. Okay, I think we've got time for a few questions. There was a couple of things I just wanted to ask. You mentioned in, when you were talking that a reduction in the symptoms wasn't good enough and actually you, you shouldn't go towards that. You know, I think you said 
from 500 to 490 checks or whatever. So I just wondered why you thought that just a reduction wasn't good enough. And also... Oh, well, can we just deal with that in the first place? Oh, sorry. That's all right. Yeah. So my memory is... Yeah. <laughs> and I think, that, I think what you're referring to is the idea that we can either do things by just not doing OCD stuff or doing things in an anti-OCD way, yeah? And what I mean by that is, yes, it's important to... Uh, if you've got, say, contamination fears of public toilets to be able to uh, use the public toilets in a, in a non-OCD way. But actually, it's more helpful in the long term to be able to put your hand down the toilet and touch things on your hands and touch things around you, this, that, and the other. Yeah? That would be the anti-OCD way. Yeah? And it's a lot more effective in the long term to be able to go over the top, hunt the tigers down, and be able to uh, confront those particular things. So, Overlearning. So so a reduction really isn't going to cut it, really? Well, it's a good start, yeah. but it's, I often think of it as embers in the fire. Mm. In other words, that the embers can easily blow up again yeah. Yeah, when you're in, under particular stresses and so on. And, and then another point around sort of um, just your beliefs around, so if you're in a distressing situation and you're you know, worried that you were going to knock somebody down, which I've had with the driving, and... Is there a, a sort of school of thought that says maybe you need to go back to sort of your core beliefs about yourself? Because I think for me, yes, I'd, I'd think I've knocked somebody down and I'm worried about the harm. But then I think it links back to me that sometimes I think, oh, you know, I'm not trustworthy or I can't do this. You know, like your sort of core beliefs, mm -hmm. not, not even linked to that particular scenario, but back to your, your actual core beliefs about yourself. <laughs> Because I think yeah. sometimes it's. I mean, I think if that. you've had a good trials of evidence-based therapies and CBT and good response, you know, exposure and so on, and you're still having difficulties, yeah, then then you need to maybe broaden out and try different approaches. And as you say, one of those might be looking at some of your early beliefs and, and so on, things with something called schema therapy. But the first thing is really to have good trials of, of CBT and really try and tackle the the functional impairment in your life. Uh, thanks for your thanks for your presentation. Um, I've got one question and, and one comment. The, the first question was, um, I see I can see the benefit of being externally focused, but one one of your slides and um, kind of showed hyper vigilance and and hyper awareness that twenty four hour security. How how would you suggest kind of managing that that tension between yeah. knowing it's beneficial to be externally focused but being yeah. constantly triggered? Yeah. I think the first step is to be aware of your, where your awareness and tension is going, isn't it? So that you know that, oh yes, look, this is my attention system focusing on the threat. So that you can then start to be able to choose to refocus your attention more externally. Right, yeah? okay. So it's, 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 these are very automatic processes. And once you can start to make them more conscious awareness of what it is that you're doing automatically, you can start to try and bring it more back to your values and what's important in your life, what's more helpful. Right, thanks. And I just, um, I was just struggling to map a particular thought that I've had in, in the past, which is about a fear of not being able to do something. So, for example, not being able to move. And I, and I saw the kind of the thought processes you ha that were outlined there, and very much it seemed to me, um, and it may be misinterpreting them, but it's very much it's something that you have a thought and something will happen, some kind of negative consequence. So if you have a thought about what, I guess, what won't happen, does that, I don't know if that makes sense, i.e. Um, I can't, you know, I can't move or I can't get up. How would that, where would you kind of map to that, to okay. those thought processes? Uh, uh, we're getting into the individual Sure, uh, okay, I don't Things want... here. And I think we'd need to spend a little bit more time trying to unpack exactly what it is that the fears are, because I suspect it's somewhere a little bit before that, because I think you're focusing now on, as you say, the c unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers. We've got a question from. Hi there, uh, thanks for your speech. Um, I've got a question about ERP. Um, 
When I sometimes try and do it EIP, I struggle to trigger. And um, what I mean by trigger is have the emotional response, the response that sends the anxiety. Um, with that in mind, is it still useful to try and do our ERP if you're struggling to generate the anxiety? I feel this is a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Again, without knowing a lot more detail about exactly what your particular obsessions are, which we're not going to go do now, it's difficult to answer that particular question. Yeah? But I agree, in principle, yes, there's no point in doing ERP if you're not actually going to... Um, experience uh, the, the the anxiety and, and so on because it, it wouldn't be the exposure really. Yeah. We're gonna go. Um, we're gonna have some time for questions uh, later on today. Okay. I'm happy to take some questions at the end and so on. Yeah. So we've got to finish now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.